lectures now. The second session on Sunday to 27th comprises of uh, three state-of-the-art lectures. Uh, the practice of gastroenterology and hepatology has grown over the years from just a couple of centers a few days ago to those of expertise in all major cities of the country. In his talk, Professor Anwar Ahmed Khan, one of the pioneers in introducing gastroenterology hepatology as a speciality in Pakistan, will be talking about how the practice has evolved over the years and our hopes for the future. Managing special populations with hepatitis C remains a challenge for hepatologists, and Professor Paul Ko will be talking about these difficult to treat cases. Professor Yon P. Frias will highlight how NAFLD should be addressed as part of a systemic disease. The chairpersons for this uh, session will be Professor Parvez Ashraf, Professor Sharbat Khan Mandokhel, Professor Amanullah Abbasi, Professor Arif Mehmood Siddiqui, and Professor Altaf Alam. We will be start starting with Professor Anwar -e Khan's lecture. Professor Anwar, introducing Professor Anwar, he is Professor and ex chairman and Dean Sheikh Zaid Postgraduate Medical Institute, Lahore, consultant gastroenterologist, hepatologist at Doctors Hospital. He, is, he has been one of the pioneers of initiating postgraduate training in gastroenterology in Pakistan and has more than three decades of working in Pakistan as an academician, researcher, clinician, and mentor. Professor Anwar. All right. Uh, talking about uh, hepatology, we have to go back to the uh, move to Chicago in 1938, just before the Second World War, as the things were getting hard for him to pursue his passion for hepatology. In New York, he went to Mount Sinai Hospital as a small university hospital, but then he shaped to develop Mount Sinai as a major teaching center. He had a passion for hepatology and developing hepatology and studying the structure, physiology, and all the diseases related with it. He was the pioneer of starting AASLD, and the first meeting in 1950 was chaired by him. To his credit were 800 papers, 28 books, and after his passing away, in his honor, the Mount Sinai University developed a Hans Popper uh, study of hepatology center. The mission of that, mission of that was dissemination of knowledge about normal and diseased liver. Professor Hyman Zimmerman, born in 1914, he studied initially in Chicago, but moved to Washington, DC. And he was associated with as professor at the George Washington University, Georgetown University, Veteran Administration Hospital, and Bethesda Naval Hospital. I had the opportunity and the, uh, the, the time I was there doing my fellowship under his tutelage to spend three years. And I found him the kindest person I, I had ever come across. And he was uh, always ready and keen to teach. And you could stop him and ask him questions anytime. He was a giant in hepatology, published 300 papers, 63 chapters. And his reference book, I'm sure all the postgraduate students will know is the toxic, toxicology of liver diseases. Uh, I was totally influenced by his demeanor and his teaching style. And uh, that has really influenced me to develop whatever I am today. The second book of, or a second edition of Hepatology of Toxicology of Liver Disease was published two months after his passing away. Professor Kamal Ishaq, known in US as Aishak. He, he was born and raised in, in Cairo, and that's where his initial training was. He moved to Armed Forces of uh, Pathology in the US, uh, which is based as a major center uh, in Washington, DC. Kamal Aishak and Hai Zimmerman worked very close together. Kamal Aishak, was getting biopsies from all over the world and he would read them free of cost. And he was getting pathology from all over the world. And he 
described liver tumors, inherited liver diseases, viral hepatitis, drug-induced liver injury, and published several uh, chapters in the books, and it's a famous one was with Max Sween, describing the pathology of liver. The AFIP Atlas of Tumors is a major landmark for his publications. Isaac's score is today considered to be an important aspect of reading liver biopsies. Isaac, and I had the opportunity of working with Isaac. Professor Dame Sheila Sherlock, born in 1918, pioneer in liver histology. She is the one who introduced liver biopsy and study of liver biopsy for, for hepatic diseases. Before that, the pathology of liver was on basis of either autopsies or on surgery. She had a keen interest in studying the immunology of liver, primary biliary cirrhosis, autoimmune hepatitis, and the description of these diseases was her major hallmark of work. She promoted translational research, which is integration of basic bench research with population and patient work. And she also helped Professor uh, Roger William to develop transplant centers. Roger Williams is uh, known all over the world for his work in uh, liver transplant, hepatologist. He was born in 1931, graduated from London Hospital Medical College in 1949. He worked with Sheila Sherlock initially in Royal Free and later on went to Columbia University for further invasive testing of liver. He developed the King's College criteria for liver failure, few modification of child score, acute and chronic liver disease, and he mitigated the uh, liver transplant center in King's College, where Roy Kahn helped as a, as a transplant surgeon. His major work was in NFLD and studying difficult cases in liver. Professor Roger William passed away this year. Professor Kuno Okuda, born in 1921 in Tokyo, Japan, graduated in Manchuria, China, where his father was working as a veterinary surgeon. He was, uh, he graduated from Manchuria, moved on to Chiba University, but then moved on to Johns Hopkins where he spent close to five years initially studying, study of uh, liver diseases, and then moved back to Kurume, Japan, where hepatocellular carcinoma was prevalent. And he worked for eight years in Kurume University and described the Okuda score of hepatocellular carcinoma, and then went to Chiba University, where he did all the invasive work in liver, and Chiba needle was described by him. Chief editor of Journal of Gastroenterology and Hepatology, and president of International Association of Study of Liver Disease, and pioneer of starting Apazel, and president of Apazel. He was an avid learner. At the age of 61, he did his PhD from Fukuoka University. And it's known that he passed away while he was working in the lab. Tom Starzl, everyone knows Tom as a father of liver transplant. Born in Iowa, he moved on to Colorado where the University of Colorado, he started working towards kidney and liver transplant. The first kidney transplant was done by him in 1963. And around the same time, he did liver transplant. But unfortunately, the small, uh, the young child, he passed away because of problem of immunosuppression. Then he gave up liver transplant. He worked on developing the immunosuppressant drugs. He worked with the drug companies. And in 1967, with the help of Sandoz, uh, they developed cyclosporin. And then he started liver transplant. And his first successful liver transplant anywhere in the world was in 1967 by Tom Starzl. He moved on to Pittsburgh and developed the famous transplant center with the University of Pittsburgh. And later on, it was named after him. He developed the organ transplant sharing system 
at UNOS and published more than 2,000 paper and about 280 chapters in books. And this is the time when it shows that before cyclosporin, the, uh, the uh, liver transplant uh, had a very high mortality, about 40% survival rate. And after these drugs, the graph going up for survival. And now it is close to 95%. In Pakistani perspective, everyone who has come across Sarwar Jahan Zuberi recognized her as a very kind person and a very good teacher and somebody who will come across you and you'll never forget and you'll always learn from her. She was a very close friend and a dear colleague. She was born in 1934, graduated from Dow Medical College in 1956, moved on to UK and worked in Birmingham General Hospital and later on in Lehi Clinic. That's where she developed the passion for studying liver and doing research. She is actually the originator of Pakistan Medical Research Council and became the director of PMRC, where she worked from 67 to 96 and retired as a scientist emeritus. She also developed the Liver Transplant Studies Center and as a dean of liver diseases study at the Ziauddin University. She published extensively, traveled extensively, and spoke uh, in all the major conferences in the world. She was founder member of APASL, president of APASL in 1994 till 96, founder member of PSG and president in 95 to 97. Her studies were based on hepatitis research, chronic liver disease, cirrhosis, and management of these diseases. Dr. Huma Qureshi worked very closely with her and then followed in her footsteps, became the director of PMRC. Professor Zuberi worked very closely with the living legend, Professor Adi Brizvi. These founding members laid the basis of diversifying hepatology, which was not only the basic bench research in hepatology, but studying hepatitis. If you look at hepatitis, hepatitis A was first discovered in 1973 by Stephen Feinstone, and it was known for thousands of years as a communicable uh, jaundice or hepatitis, uh, known in the chronic history of, by Greeks and by uh, Romans and in the Arab literature, you find spreading hepatitis in the communities, but nobody knew what it was. And it was first described by Feinstone that it was named as hepatitis A. More than 90% of Pakistani population is uh, seropositive in the childhood. And almost everyone gets positive in their adult age. Bloomberg got the Nobel uh, Prize in 1965 for describing hepatitis B, and he also helped develop the serum and recombinant vaccine. And that has been the hallmark of change of treatment and dealing with hepatitis B for prevention. Pakistan has about two to 5% of prevalence rate in different parts of the country. Dr. Chu and Houghton shared the Nobel Prize in 1989 for describing what is hepatitis C when I was working with High Zimmerman and Leonard Seif, 1980s, they were, they were working on chimpanzees and transmission of blood-borne non-A, non-B hepatitis was known at that time. But later on, it was clearly described and identified. Delta hepatitis D was described by Rosetto from Italy, 1977. And it has very high prevalence in Mongolia. And we see in blood transfusion patients uh, of about 16% in hepatitis, uh, hepatitis uh, D. It is a piggyback hepatitis for B. E was first described by Sultan Muhammad Khoru from Kashmir as non-A, non-B hepatitis, especially spreading readily in monsoon season. And it was known that it was spreading by polluted water. Balin identified it and named it as hepatitis E by electron microscopy. 
Hepatitis G in 1995 was described by Simon and Alter. In 1996, it was Dr. G. Baker who first developed uh, chronic liver disease when he was negative for A, B, C, D, and, and, and he was known to have a chronic inflammation. When his blood was injected to chimpanzees, they developed hepatitis. And that's how hepatitis G uh, was described as GB hepatitis. And GBC is the only one which causes uh, chronic liver disease, but it is not a, uh, it's a, it's a threatening problem. It is there, uh, and some people say it's trying to find the disease. Hepatitis F has been described in 1994 only in animals, but it has not been borne out as a significant hepatitis. The treatment protocols we see from all the different societies and universities all over the world by NIH, AASLD, EASL, EPASL, International Society of Liver Disease, CDC, WHO, and Pakistan Society of Hepatology. And we look forward to these guidelines whenever they're published. Hepatitis A and E in, in the uh, in perspective of Pakistan is the most common problem. And especially all of us get infected with hepatitis A and it has a lifetime immunity. Fortunately, in childhood, it doesn't cause serious problem. But hepatitis E, on the other hand, for pregnant women is a bad news. The mortality is from 10 to 20%. And if they're not given ICU care, the mortality is very high. B and D in Pakistan had extensive survey by PMRC with Dr. Huma Krashi and Sarvar Jahan Zubairi. And we found out that different parts of the country have different prevalence rate, two to 5% in Southern Punjab, Balochistan, and Sindh. And there is association of Delta hepatitis in the same regions. Media coverage has been given due importance in Pakistan, but much more is needed. How to prevent injection use and prevention of uh, hepatitis B and C. Government EPI program, vaccination in childhood, is bearing fruit we see a declining trend of hepatitis B, but it is still a major cause for liver cirrhosis and FCC. Government in all provinces has started treatment, free treatment program by nucleoside analogs and tacover and tenofovir. And role of, uh, role of hepatologist is to educate, give clear guidelines for all those people who are treating hepatitis B. Hepatitis C is another story. Pakistan, unfortunately, is the second highest prevalence country in the world. WHO and CDC had helped Pakistan to establish national hepatitis strategic framework in 2017. And the government had already started uh, programs for testing and treating in 2010. Uh, I remember in Sheikh Zayed Hospital, we had started treatment with interferon and rebavirine. Uh, with not very good results, but in 2014, when SFOS came in vogue, then the treatment paradigm had changed. Pakistan Society of Guide, uh, gave guidelines published with enormous work and effort by Professor Umar and the Pakistan Society team, and enormous work by Professor Altaf Alam and Professor Faruqi, putting together the guidelines for treatment for soft DECLA, soft valve, and results reaching up to 95%. Guidelines by HEPNET, by Arif Amir Nawaz, with the help of Altaf Alam and Javed Faruqi, are widely, widely distributed and published. Government of Punjab set up hepatitis centers in all teaching hospitals and district hospitals. This was spearheaded by Professor Gayas, and different uh, committees were set up and they developed 17 centers in Punjab, very well equipped and for treating, testing and treating hepatitis C. Professor Faisal Masood was the director of this committee in Punjab through the government. God bless him, we miss him. He was a great friend and a visionary educator. These efforts were emulated by Pakhtunkhwa, Sindh and Blochistan. Philanthropic setup, test and treat 
three centers in Gujranwala under the guidance of Dr. Asad Chaudhary with Gujranwala Liver Foundation, Parsa, and ECHO, and in Faisalabad through the guidance of Professor Zahir Yasin Hashmi, a dear friend, and in Karachi by Professor Saad Niaz, have contributed enormously treating hundreds of thousands of patients. And these heroes need laurels. Generic uh, directly acting agents with a fixed price of less than 4,000 by DRAP in the government, approximately $20 per three month course, has a robust program for starting treatment uh, free of cost by the government, but unfortunately it is not available everywhere in Pakistan. The WHO goal for eliminating hepatitis C by 2030 in 10 years away, and a sustained government support and effort is needed. We do not want to have a fatigue of treating these patients. Unfortunately, a lot of these programs are started with a lot of enthusiasm, but you run into problems and people move away and the interest is lost. And that should not happen if you want to meet that goal. The Egyptian model is needed to be looked at closely by the government where 40% cost is borne by government and 60% by the insurance. Unfortunately, in Pakistan, there is no a robust insurance program to, to treat the patients who do not afford. Egyptian model is like they have uh, different uh, molecules, uh, different circles where they actually uh, take responsibility for treatment and dividing the whole country. And these different circles, they are reporting to the central data collection and they want to make sure that nobody is falling through the cracks and everyone gets the fair chance of, of uh, detection and treatment. Liver transplant. We have an enormous burden of liver disease with 200 pop million population in Pakistan. Hepatitis B and C are 10% in population, like 20 million people. NAFLD and NASH, you have all heard, is increasing in, the, in, in Pakistan. About 1 million people have chronic liver disease and ultimately are going to have end-state liver disease and need liver transplant. The first liver transplant was at Sheikh Zayed Hospital on 12th August in 2011. Dr. Tariq Bangash and Amar Latif, with the help of our friend from India, Dr. Subhash Gupta, had performed the first liver transplant in the country. And I had the opportunity of helping them develop this liver transplant center. And they are providing enormous service. PKLI is a hope and breath of fresh air. Uh, started in 2017 with liver and kidney transplant planned. And the first transplant was started by uh, Dr. Faisal Dar in 2020. His team has spearheaded the transplant program uh, in Islamabad. The current board is very much in favor and trying to promote and boost this program. In Gamber Sindh is a unique setup for free liver transplant. When first uh, people started learning about a free liver transplant, you would scratch your head, how is it possible? But with the help and guidance of Dr. Abdul Wahab Dogar, who has been a close friend and colleague, is providing a great service and imparting teaching, and th that has to be encouraged. But the strict criteria and the standards have to be met. The government sector in Karachi, SIUT, and the National Institute of Solid Organ and Tissue Transplant at Sarwar Jahan Zubairi uh, Liver Center at Dow University, and in SIUT are making great progress. And SIUT led by Professor Adib Rizvi is a center of excellence. And that's where the first kidney transplant was done. And he has the capacity and stamina of developing at a very high standard level. Private sector in Islamabad and Lahore are providing service for affordable patients. 
keeping them in the comfort of the home environment in Pakistan. These are spearheaded by Professor Fesseldar. They're providing a great service. I think that has to be developed further. Unfortunately, majority of the people who require liver transplant do not have the capacity to bear those costs. Therefore, we do need some uh, very big boost for the public sector to develop centers. And the responsibility lies on the transplant centers to train uh, our doctors to develop that capacity. The ethics of and the laws of Human Organ Transplant Authority must be respected with full spirit and cast off the stigma which is attached in the past of organ trade in Pakistan. Future needs of hepatology in Pakistan. These are some of my thoughts. Collective spirit and cooperation and teamwork is needed. FCPS in transplant hepatology, two years of training after four years of general surgery to become a transplant hepatology, uh, transplant uh, liver surgeon. For transplant hepatologists, one to two years, like in US, there's a one year of special transplant hepatology training in transplant centers. After FCPS in gastroenterology, to be transplant hepatologist, followed by evaluation by CPSP and universities, and they can award them degrees. All transplant centers share responsibility for teaching. Universities develop basic research programs and assign funds, award MD, MS, and PhD degrees. University of Health Sciences has recently taken these steps with vision of the VC and the support of the board. All private and government teaching centers must have robust research programs with funds allocated through PMRC and Higher Education Commission, federal and provincial, universities and the drug companies. Future of hepatology in Pakistan is bright, but we have to give credence and support to our researchers. Unfortunately, they have not gotten their due status. Incentives must be given to people who are doing basic bench research and, and the clinical research which should be meaningful. Collaboration with established universities like Punjab University, Al Khan University, Karachi University, University of Peshawar, Bahaud Zindagi University and HEJ for a basic research and training. That is extremely important. I had the opportunity to work with the Punjab University and they have robust established basic science research, research centers. Only a collaboration and looking into those areas is needed. Pakistan is an emerging economy, shedding its lethargic past, has vibrant youth, exemplary tackling with vision of COVID-19 by the government is lauded all over the world. I see a very bright future of hepatology in Pakistan. With this, I thank the organizer, Professor Altaf Alam, and Professor Zishan, and Dr. Bushra, and my dear friend, Dr. Javed Faruqi, for the opportunity of giving me uh, this uh, place for making this talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Anwar. Thank you for elaborating upon the past of hepatology and giving us hope for the future. Our next speaker is Professor Paul Ko. Professor Paul Ko is a professor of medicine, gastroenterology, and hepatology at the Stanford University Medical Center. Prior to, the jo to joining faculty at Stanford, he was at Indiana University for 21 years, where he served as medical director of liver transplantation. He has distinguished himself in the field of hepatitis C therapeutics and has been the principal investigator on multiple international trials. He recently authored the ACG guidelines on evaluation of abnormal liver chemistries. Professor Paul Ko is going to be talking about hepatitis C treatment in special populations. Professor Paul. Thank you very much. I'm going to just make sure that I am sharing the correct screen now. Yes, it's the correct screen and we can also see you. Okay, great. Thank you so much for the kind invitation. And I enjoyed so much hearing about the progress in Pakistan with regard to hepatology, indeed a bright future. And 
Today, I'm going to talk about treatment of hepatitis C in special populations that, again, worldwide, we all face. So here are my disclosures. And why don't we go ahead and get started? So this audience already is well-versed in hepatitis C worldwide. And we have just heard that Pakistan has the second highest hepatitis C burden worldwide. In the United States, we're relatively spared, but we still have 2 million infected individuals. But you can see here that other parts of the world have far higher disease burdens. Fortunately, in the DAA era, we are now treating large numbers of these individuals and the efficacy of our DAA therapies are really spectacular. And moreover, the initial cost of the DAA therapies, which limited the access for treatment have fallen considerably worldwide and there are readily available generics now available and no longer is the cost of DAA therapy a burden even for low and middle income countries. This has led the WHO to announce a very um, bold goal, which was to eliminate viral hepatitis as a major global public health threat by 2030. And we just heard about the progress in Pakistan. Uh, these targets included 90% of individuals with viral hepatitis that are diagnosed, 80% treated with a two thirds reduction in mortality. And again, in the US we have elimination plans. And again, many countries have moved forward with ambitious plans and are on their way to eliminating hepatitis C. We just heard about Egypt, which had a recent report in the New England Journal, which just showed just remarkable progress in screening and diagnosing and treating a large number of their uh, individuals who had chronic hepatitis C. So these are the tools we have in the US, and I'm gonna show these first, just to show that if you initiate therapy now in the DAA era, treatment success is virtually guaranteed. All of the first line treatment options lead to sustained response rates that are above 95%. So treating and curing the individual is actually quite straightforward. When we look at the treatment tools you have in uh, Pakistan, it, the primary options you have are a sophosphere with an NS5A inhibitor, and you have two, decladosphere, velpatosphere. And you can see here that the efficacy rates are really also outstanding for uh, those who present for treatment for hepatitis C. So the question then becomes, who are these special populations or more difficult to treat populations that we need to consider now in 2020? Because to eliminate hepatitis C and reach WHO guidance benchmarks, we're going to need to be able to treat all of the special populations in addition to those that we encounter routinely in practice. And I, list of populations here that I think now are evolving as special populations. And as you'll be happy to see during the talk, we can achieve high sustained response rate in the vast majority of these individuals. So who are these individuals? Well, decompensated cirrhosis, those with hepatocellular cancer, and I very much enjoyed hearing about the progress you've made in transplant. Pregnant females, uh, acute hepatitis C cases, including uh, those men who have sex with men, as well as uh, those who inject drugs, DAA failures, renal failure, and worldwide, uh, the opiate epidemic has really changed the epidemiology of hepatitis C, particularly in the US, but elsewhere. And this is another population, again, that we're going to need to engage and create care models for if we're going to eliminate hepatitis C. So let's go on to decompensated liver disease right now. The hepatitis C th therapies that we use now, they're use is guided by the child turcot Q classification. And as all of you in this audience know, we have those that are compensated child turcot Q A, then we have those that are decompensated, these are B and C. And this is all dependent upon whether or not ascites is present, the bilirubin is elevated, the albumin is reduced, the prothrombin time is prolonged, or there is hepatic encephalopathy. And why this is important is because some direct acting antiviral agents can't be used in decompensated liver disease. Now, I know that you probably have a limited exposure to uh, the protease inhibitors, and I just show you some of them. Semeprevir is now no longer available, but protease inhibitors such as semeprevir, grisoprevir, glucaprevir, and 
voxilaprevir are all not to be administered in individuals who have advanced cirrhosis, that is child Turcot Q, B or C cirrhosis. And the reason for this is because of the uh, serum levels. The PK changes considerably. And what happens is that you get unintended, uh, very high levels of the protease inhibitors in some individuals with decompensated cirrhosis. And so we have to stay away from uh, this class of medicine. Indeed, our own um, FDA released an advisory, and it was gratifying that the risk of decompensation in those with very advanced liver disease got protease inhibitors was extremely low, but nonetheless, there was a small number of cases in the US and it just again, further reinforced that we're going to need uh, in decompensated cirrhosis to stay away from this particular class. Again, fortunately in Pakistan, you use sofosfavir and you use this with the NS5A inhibitors and these can be given safely across all uh, cirrhosis levels, child TERCOP-Q, A, B, and C. The sustained response rates are lower in cirrhosis. Why is that? Well, multiple reasons. One, with the portal hypertension, there's reduced drug delivery. And again, with the fibrosis, there is reduced drug uptake. There's portal systemic shunting. Moreover, with the decreased hepatocyte mass with the fibrosis, it's likely much more difficult to get adequate levels of DAA therapy into the infected hepatocytes. And this is why for some DAA therapies, duration actually does make a difference, particularly when we get to those with significant decompensation. So these are our therapeutic options for those who have decompensated liver disease. And again, the sustained response rates are no longer quite as robust, but they're still quite good, above 85%. We have now settled on really the pangenotypic options, uh, sofosfavir, velpatosfavir, and ribavirin in the US, which is our uh, primary first line treatment for those with decompensated cirrhosis. And then worldwide, there's sofosfavir, decladosfavir, and ribavirin as well. And we typically use ribavirin if we can. However, in decompensated cirrhosis, as all of you know, it sometimes is not particularly well tolerated. And you can certainly Ex remove the ribavirin in those who are anemic or won't be able to tolerate this and extend the duration to uh, 24 weeks. And again, this is actually something that we do quite commonly in the US and people with advanced uh, cirrhosis and say a hemoglobin that's in the 789 range where a dose of ribavirin may not be well tolerated. However, this doesn't work particularly well in genotype three where the addition of ribavirin really does seem to make a difference in the setting of advanced decompensated cirrhosis. The other important caveat here with the use of ribavirin is that, as all of you know, many of these decompensated individuals have significantly reduced GFRs and you have to be quite judicious in your initial dosing of ribavirin in these individuals, or you can see substantial anemia within the first few weeks of treatment. And again, with regard to those who uh, are decompensated, who present to your center. Since you're beginning to do liver transplants now, or you, you have well-established programs now for over a decade, it looks like, uh, one of the questions in these decompensated individuals is if you treat them, who are the individuals who are actually going to successfully recompensate? Who might you be able to remove from the list? And we've had multiple, multiple reports that have ex described large experiences with this. And we now have a pretty reasonable idea about who's going to improve and who isn't. This was a study that came from France that looked at 77 cirrhotic individuals as well as hepatocellular carcinoma patients. In the transplant population though, they treated the hepatitis C cirrhosis patients and they were able to delist just about 18% of these individuals over time. And again, this has been now replicated in multiple studies and we'll show a few other studies that managed to confirm these findings. But the important thing here is if you look at those who do respond, and so in this pie chart here and those with decompensated cirrhosis, you had some individuals who had a complete response. That means the bilirubin normalized, the prothrombin time normalized, albumin was, was normal, no ascites, no encephalopathy. Just a third of individuals over time decomp are recompensated in this decompensated group. And the vast majority of these individuals 
were actually already quite only mildly decompensated. Almost three-fourths were child TERCOPQ A in this group, and just minorities were child TERCOPQ B and C. So once you get to more advanced fibrosis with decompensation, it appears that it's much less straightforward to recompensate. This was also shown in a study here. This was from Spain. Again, similar strategy. They tried to treat individuals with hepatitis C-related cirrhosis to see uh, which individuals could actually be inactivated from the transplant list. And again, what they found was that by week 12 of therapy, and you can see here in the lighter blue that there was a drop in the MELD score and week 12 of therapy was associated with a higher rate of inactivation. That is, if your MELD score declined here on treatment, that you are more likely to become inactivated on the transplant list. There was a very large uh, present or experience that was just recently published, and this paper is just online now, that looked at DAA therapy in over 600 patients with decompensated cirrhosis, and this came from the U.S. Target Registry, and these individuals uh, were treated with DAA therapy, and as you can see here, the overall SVR rate was 90%, which is really quite robust. But then these individuals were followed for both short term, that means nine to 26 weeks, as well as uh, individuals treated for or followed for longer periods of time with the endpoints of hepatocellular function assessment with MELD score, as well as bilirubin and albumin. And what you can see here is that the individuals who recompensated were just again about a quarter of individuals achieved a significant decrease of MELD score of three points during short-term follow-up. Follow up. And this number really didn't increase that much, up to 29% uh, at, in long-term follow-up with a final MELD score less than 10 achieved in just a quarter of individuals. And certainly individuals died, certainly individuals underwent orthotopic liver transplant. And so you can see here, if you're looking for predictors of MELD improvement, among the interesting predictors was if your ALT level was low, then you were less likely to improve. And long-term, again, low ALT, the more advanced uh, fib or cirrhosis, child circop QC, as well as a MELD score above 16, did not seem to correlate well with MELD score improvement. And so if you have individuals who are presenting to your center for transplant with hepatitis C, take these data into account when you consider who it is that you may wish to treat. Uh, we certainly um, look at these when we visit patients or in clinic, in our transplant clinic, and we discuss these outcomes and findings with our patients. And we tell them that if we treat them prior to transplant, we're going to reduce inflammation, but that really just about 20% of these individuals seem to improve and can be delisted. If they have severe portal hypertension, then these are individuals you're much better off transplanting. In the US, again, our epidemiology is such that many of our, our patients with hepatitis C, in fact, the vast majority who present for transplant evaluation also have hepatocellular cancer. And so these individuals then can be counseled and they can decide whether or not they want to be treated. And again, if your MELD score is above 20, we really discourage if they're transplant candidates with moving forward with DAA therapy. We do use hepatitis C nucleic acid uh, positive donors quite frequently here in the U.S. when available. Obviously, the patient's not a transplant candidate, and it, uh, then we treat these individuals as long as their lifespan is generally going to be longer than a year. Let's also look at some of the other uh, special populations. This is a very interesting, very common uh, presentation that is hepatitis C with hepatocellular cancer. And it's been postulated that hepatitis C has potentially both direct and indirect mechanisms by which it leads to hepatocellular cancer in the setting of cirrhosis. And approximately four years ago, just as the DAA era was beginning to ramp up, what came about were several concerning studies. This was the original Italian study that looked at individuals with hepatitis C with hepatocellular carcinoma who had their tumors treated and then received DAA therapy. And I turn your attention here to the right because what they reported was that within just months of initiating therapy, there were recurrent, very biologically aggressive hepatocellular cancers being noted. And some of these had three nodules, infiltrative pattern. And because this wasn't reported in the interferon era, 
when we treated far fewer decompensated individuals with liver cancer, there were significant concern that actually the GAA therapies that we had were somehow changing the biologic behavior of hepatocellular cancers. And again, this was a report from the Barcelona group that had again, a similar concern, which was that with initiation of DAA therapy shown down here, that there was aggressive rapid occurrence, recurrence of hepatocellular cancer. And again, it seemed that treatment of hepatitis C changed the biologic behavior of hepatocellular cancers. These were small single center studies with larger, more well-controlled studies. And I just show one here. What has been demonstrated is, is that direct acting antiviral agent or DA therapy is generally associated with improved survival in patients with a history of hepatocellular carcinoma. And uh, this was a case control study that was reported in the US. And you can see here that uh, this, in this particular uh, group here, you have here the DAA untreated in the blue, you have the DAA treated individuals here in the uh, red line here. And what you can see here is a risk of death. And you can see here that DAA therapy was associated with a lower mortality significant, the hazard ratio 0.54 for in favor of DAA therapy. And thus, when you encounter these individuals with hepatocellular carcinoma and hepatitis C, you should, in addition to addressing the hepatocellular carcinoma, you should also offer treatment for hepatitis C for these individuals. However, this very interesting paper, which is again in press online right now, uh, reported an Italian experience that looked at the risk of a hepatocellular carcinoma and hepatitis C infection in DAA treated patients with cirrhosis. And again, here's the hazard ratio here on the y-axis here. So what they did was that they characterized the type of liver masses they were seeing on imaging. And what they saw was that if you had an undefined non-malignant nodule, and again, we all have patients who get dynamic imaging, CT or MRI, and they'll call it dysplastic nodule or some other nodule which, isn't, which is incompletely characterized and you want follow-up imaging. Those individuals who were treated for hepatitis C with DAA therapies who had these undefined nodules seem to have this very early peak where they would develop hepatocellular cancer. And what this tells us is that you need to characterize accurately all of these indeterminate nodules prior to DA therapy in the setting of hepatitis C and cirrhosis. And obviously that also means chasing down all of the elevated AFP levels as well. What about pregnancy? This was a very interesting paper that was uh, presented last year. And again, because of the opiate epidemic that we have worldwide, which really significantly affects the United States as well, we have a larger number of childbearing women now who are, have chronic hepatitis C who are developed acute hepatitis C. And this was a study that looked at treating hepatitis C in women who are pregnant. For women who are pregnant, engaging in the healthcare system while they're pregnant may be their first introduction to the healthcare system. In the US, this is a time when they have insurance. And so these individuals were screened and recruited and they were able to enroll nine individuals for treatment for hepatitis C and they all had genotype one. They all received lidiposphere sulfosphere for 12 weeks. And all of these individuals achieved sustained virologic response with their infants also remaining negative to date. So one might think this is something that we should pursue further there were many caveats with this report. And one of them was that recruitment was actually a substantial challenge in this study. And over a two year recruitment period, they encountered 170 viremic HCV pregnant women, only 29 screened for the study, 20 failed to enroll, most commonly because of genotype, but also uh, declined for a variety of reasons to participate. And so we are going to need to see additional data for treatment of hepatitis C in pregnancy. This tells us, at least in this pilot study, it is feasible. It's not yet ready for prime time. But again, if we're going to eliminate hepatitis C, this is an ideal time during pregnancy to screen and engage women. And again, if we don't treat during pregnancy, we can certainly encourage them after delivering to go ahead and treat. And again, our DAA treatments appear, at least in this preliminary report, 
to be safe during pregnancy. This brings us to acute hepatitis C, where uh, another population that we see now with more frequency, particularly in the US with our younger population getting infected and our recent guidance documents have changed. We used to, when we saw acute hepatitis C, we used to follow the patient. We used to see if they clear spontaneously or went on to chronicity, as this audience well knows, those who have acute hepatitis C, there's still about a 75% chance they're going to go on and develop chronic hepatitis C. Our guidance has now changed and as has our practice. And when we identify somebody with acute hepatitis C, we refer these individuals for therapy in combination with some harm reduction measures. At least in our population, many of these individuals have other comorbidities, either they are uh, abusing opioids or they have other harmful behaviors. And so we refer for treatment, we diagnose the hepatitis C. If we, the RNA comes back detected, then these individuals, in addition to harm reduction referrals, are referred for immediate treatment with uh, pangenotypic, in general, pangenotypic therapy. And this was a study that just showed uh, from the uh, AIDS clinical trial group in the US. And this was in male HIV patients who had acute hepatitis C infection. These individuals received eight weeks of DAA therapy, all achieved sustained virologic response. And again, you can err on the side of perhaps slightly shorter durations of therapy for hepatitis C and acute hepatitis uh, in those who present with acute hepatitis. But again, the goal is to get an SVR. It's not to truncate therapy too significantly. And we have in the US an indication for eight weeks with ledipasvir and sofosfavir. This was a study looking at six weeks of our other pangenotypic regimen that we have in the US besides sofosfavir, velpatasvir, clocapavir, preventasvir. And here they used a six week duration for acute hepatitis C with just one relapse in 28 individuals. So again, very high sustained virologic response rates. And this was very interesting modeling study that was uh, published a couple of years ago. And what they did was they tried to look at patients and they tried to account for the risk of patients with hepatitis C transmitting the hepatitis C and whether or not it was cost effective to treat acute hepatitis C. And indeed they were able to show that it is actually cost savings here to treat acute hepatitis C. And again, the costs of DAA therapies in many parts of the world are really quite low. So we should all be when we encounter these hepatitis C patients moving forward with treatment. DAA failures, well, we don't have very many of these, but we do have some. The sofosfavir variants rarely develop when they are gone within a few days because the replicative fitness is so poor. Protease inhibitors, when you fail with a protease inhibitor, the rashes are usually resolved by one year. And, but unfortunately, these NS5A rashes seem to persist much longer. In the US, we have the triple therapy, sofosfavir, velpatasvir, boxalaprovir. And we really use this as our salvage regimen for all DAA failures. And it's a first line therapy, obviously for NS5A exposed individuals who fail to achieve sustained virologic response. This is all based on the uh, Polaris set of studies. And this was across all genotypes, NS5A failures here. And you can see very high sustained virologic response rates with a few relapses in genotype three uh, but really otherwise outstanding sustained virologic response rates. What if you don't have self, soft valve box available to you? Well, then you are left with actually pretty reasonable option, 24 weeks of sofosfavir, velpatasvir, ribavirin, or certainly you could retreat with sofosfavir, decladosfir, and ribavirin. And this was actually looked at, as I'm going to share this data shortly, this is real world data here with sofosfavir, velpatasvir, voxilaprovir from the UK that was presented at the recent easel uh, meeting. And what you can see here was that for DAA failures, and this included all DAA failures, and they're all listed down here, sofosfavir velpatasvir, sofosfavir ledipasvir, glepib, sofosfavir decladosvir, they're all here. Overall SVR rate, 91%, genotype 3, 81%, cirrhosis, 81%. And they did note that the RAS mutations, A30K and Y93H, seem to predict retreatment failure, though because we really have in the US an exclusive first line option, we don't use RAS testing immediately when these individuals fail uh, treatment. 
this is the data was supposed to be about Pattis and Robert Byron. Uh, this was published a few years in, ago in hepatology. Uh, but again, these are those who failed uh, DAA therapy with sofosphere of belpatosphere. And these individuals were treated, again, genotypes 1, 2, and 3 with sofosphere of belpatosphere and ribavirin for 24 weeks. And really, genotype 1, 97%, genotype 2, 91%, genotype 3 still a bit lower. Uh, but again, this is our probably our best salvage option if you don't have the triple therapy available. Other potential salvage regimens are available. We do do resistance testing if we've failed soft valve box. And so thus far, I've had just one individual who has failed this salvage regimen. Again, also, sometimes you'll have individuals in, uh, and you're considering alternative regimen. And other regimens out there that can be used are glucapavir, preventative sofosfavir with ribavirin for longer durations. We use this sometimes in glucapavir, preventasvir failures. And again, we don't use gorzapavir, elbasvir as much, but this combination here also has had some limited experience, particularly in genotype three non-responders. What about renal disease? So renal patients achieve roughly the same sustained virologic response with interferon, but the ribavirin was always difficult to tolerate. The first DAA study that was on large scale was the C surfer study, which looked at grizopavir elbosphere in genotype 1 infected individuals with a per protocol SVR rate you can see here of 99%, which was really quite outstanding. Glucapavir preventasvir, again, protease and NS5A with no renal clearance, excellent sustained response rate. But the, the problem was for sofosavir based regimens that this metabolite. 007, 331 here accumulated. And in those with reduced GFRs less than 30 or who were on dialysis, these individuals, it was the concern was whether or not this caused any uh, accumulation and potential harm. We now have multiple studies that show that it doesn't. And again, this was a very nice publication recently with Sphosphoreville Patosphere, and it showed an overall SVR rate of 95%. And again, no adverse sequela. And our package insert has changed for this now. And we give, can give this as, uh, as safely as we can, grizopavir or uh, elbosphere or glucapavir or preventasphere and those on dialysis. Finally, just a few brief words about the PWID epidemic. And again, this shows maybe 10 million individuals worldwide. And again, this is a population that we're going to have to engage if we're going to eliminate hepatitis C. Our treatment regimens work. Uh, this is a recent report with sofosfavir velpatosphere, highly effective in those uh, on opiate substitution therapy here. Overall SVR8 was 94% uh, percent here, and these individuals still continue to use a variety of drugs. And if you look at this heat map on the second page here, you can see here that compliant, this reflected here daily compliance, the green bean compliant, and the beige bars here, meaning they missed a dose of their blister pack, but despite compliance not being perfect, you still had really excellent SDR rates. So the use of opiates, use or abuse, certainly shouldn't deter us from moving forward with treatment. And here, worldwide, we're going to have to create care models for those who inject drugs if we're going to eliminate hepatitis C. And this was a randomized trial looking at directly observed therapy, group therapy, or individual treatment for hepatitis C. And you can see here the overall SVR rates were still all uh, above 90% here. And so that it seems that as long as you have an engaged patient, even if they have opiate use, you should be able to achieve a sustained virologic response. And again, adding harm reduction measures seems to be of benefit in this population. This was a very nice paper that came from Iceland, and this showed that if they use treatment as prevention, that is, they diagnose these individuals, referred them for therapy immediately, what you can see here is when they started this, which was the TRAP-C program, they, Iceland has had an 82% drop in the prevalence of hepatitis C. And again, Iceland is unique. It's a small island. There's just one hospital. But it does show the concept that treatment of prevention works. And finally, this meta-analysis here just looked at DA therapy for those with recent drug use. And you can see here in this large group of studies here, overall sustained response rate 
was 88%. So special populations or difficult to treat populations can still achieve SVR at high rates. They may acquire additional multidisciplinary efforts for successful treatment. And again, we're going to have to particularly work uh, diligently for those with decompensated liver disease. If, you, if they're transplant candidates, you, they need to be counseled very carefully about the potential benefits of treating before transplant. And remember, sustained response rates are lower, uh, and, but there can be recompensation. Obviously, if transplant is, in the, is not in the picture, then treatment is probably the best option if lifespan is not warranted. For DAA failures, what I certainly hope is that suppositor of Elpatosir voxelaprevir becomes available worldwide. Uh, this regimen is actually quite highly effective, but if not, you have suppositor of Elpatosir and ribavirin, which still works for NS5A failures, uh, not quite as well in genotype three. And of course, you can still use suppositor, decladosphere, and ribavirin as well. If you have your individuals with hepatitis C and hepatocellular carcinoma, treat the liver cancer first, but treatment of hepatitis C confers a survival benefit. Pregnancy is not yet ready for prime time, but it certainly appears to be feasible. Those with acute hepatitis C should be treated immediately with concomitant harm reduction measures. Renal failure, high sustained virologic response rates. And again, worldwide, we're going to have to improve our care model for those who inject drugs if we want to eliminate hepatitis C. I'm just going to conclude with just a table showing that the ranges of SVR rates that we can get in many of these difficult to treat populations that for years we thought would never be successfully treated, indeed now are all equal to our non-special populations of hepatitis C. And again, it's going to be, I think, the challenge for all of us to put together models of care so that in 2030, we can say, that we've managed to achieve the WHO guideline. I am going to stop here. And again, I thank very much the organizers for this kind invitation. Uh, thank you, Professor Polko, uh, for the elaborate uh, talk on special populations. It was a treat to listen to you. Our next speaker is Professor Juan Pablo Frias. Uh, Professor Juan Pablo Frias, MD, is Medical Director and Principal Investigator of National Research Institute, Los Angeles, California. Dr. Frias has been involved in diabetes and metabolism-related research for over 20 years and has authored numerous publications in this field. Professor Juan P. Frias will be talking about NAFLD beyond the liver. Hello, my name is Juan Pablo Frias. I'm an endocrinologist in Los Angeles, California, where I serve as the medical director and principal investigator of the National Research Institute. Um, it is a great pleasure to be here with you today. I hope everyone's enjoying the meeting, and I want to thank the Pakistan Society of Hepatology for this very kind invitation. Hopefully, I'll get invited again and can actually visit your beautiful country sometime. So what I'm going to be speaking about today is the intersection, if you will, between fatty liver disease and type 2 diabetes. Um, there are many medications that we use that are approved for the treatment of type 2 diabetes and of fatty liver disease that are being studied in patients with NASH today, and I think may be um, very useful in the future, either in combination with NASH-specific therapy or maybe um, as monotherapy in patients, depending on what we see from these clinical trials over time. So here you see my disclosures. And I'll start by just briefly discussing some points made by Ken Cousy and his colleague at the University of Florida. And Ken's an endocrinologist who's um, very, um, very um, interested and has published a lot in the area of NASH. But he makes a point here that the relationship between type 2 diabetes and fatty liver disease really is a bi-directional association, if you will, and um, makes, I think, a very important point that this has traditionally been a disease of the hepatologist, but certainly given the increasing prevalence and in the, the morbidity and the mortality associated with fatty um, liver disease, that it really has become a major concern, I think, globally of a broad spectrum of healthcare providers, primarily um, primary care physicians, and certainly endocrinologists as well. And um, certainly for, for my colleagues as endocrinologists treating a lot of patients with type 2 diabetes, and this would be primary care physicians. In the US, certainly most type 2 diabetes patients are treated by um, primary care physicians. But this disease should be at, at center stage um, for these specialties. 
um, because type 2 diabetes appears to worsen the course of fatty liver disease, so the progression from NAPL to NASH, and, um, and fatty liver disease makes diabetes uh, management more challenging in our patients. So you really can think of fatty liver disease or NAFL as the hepatic manifestation of type 2 diabetes or the metabolic syndrome. Now, a little bit of terminology. We talk about just broadly fatty liver disease, um, greater than 5%. Hepatic steatosis can be, there's multiple causes, alcoholic liver disease. It can be um, steatogenic medications, some rare hereditary disorders. But if we talk about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or NAFL, this really is an umbrella term which encompasses both non-alcoholic fatty liver or simple or bland steatosis, so fat in the liver greater than 5%, and the more severe form or NASH, non-alcoholic steatic hepatitis. It has both, or, or, or in addition to, I should say, the steatosis, lobular inflammation, and hepatocyte damage, or ballooning as it's called, and in the United States, NASH is the third leading cause of cirrhosis, and it is now the second most common indication for a liver transplantation overall, and the number one cause of liver transplantation um, in women. So NAF4, or non-alcoholic fatty liver, again, hepatic steatosis, which can progress to steatohepatitis, or NASH, and we definitely, it's a, a diagnosis of exclusion, if you will. We have to exclude significant alcohol consumption, use of steatogenic medication, hereditary disorders. And then NASH is a diagnosis um, that needs to be, or it's a disorder that needs to be diagnosed with histology, so a biopsy, and includes not only the steatosis, but lobular inflammation, as well as hepatocyte injury, which is referred to as ballooning. And this can be with or without fibrosis. And it's commonly associated with obesity, type 2 diabetes, and many of, the, um, of the, the factors in metabolic syndrome. So dyslipidemia, hypertension, insulin resistance as well. And here we see the, the progression from a normal liver on your left through steatosis, or quote unquote simple steatosis, could be with mild inflammation, to non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So now you have the inflammation and the hepatocyte damage to potentially cirrhosis, and then very importantly, in some patients, um, hepatocellular carcinoma. And this can occur even in patients who have, do not have significant fibrosis um, in, in, um, in NASH. And the level of fibrosis or the degree of fibrosis or stage is very important because the more fibrosis, and here going from stage zero in the top to, um, to F4, stage four fibrosis, which is cirrhosis, there's an increased risk, not only of morbidity, but also of all-cause and liver-related mortality. And you can see in a patient with cirrhosis, 42-fold increase in liver-related mortality compared to someone without fibrosis. So these patients, we do need to try to determine if they have advanced fibrosis, F3, F4, because this um, portends a worse prognosis in these patients. If we look at the prevalence overall, Globally, about 25% of adults have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So this would be NAF4, so simple steatosis, or NASH. This varies geographically. In the US, it's about 24%, higher in the Middle East and in, in um, Latin America, and lowest in Africa. And importantly, the prevalence of NAF4 increases with increasing age. So it's estimated that in patients over 70 or between 70 and, and 80 years old, it's over one third of the population. And in patients without diabetes, about again, in the US anyway, about 25%, and about 20% of those patients with NAFL actually have NASH. And you can see then smaller percentages have cirrhosis, hepatocellular carcinoma, need a liver plant, uh, transplant, or have um, mortality related to this disease. But I think what's very important is that in patients with type 2 diabetes, not only is the prevalence of NAFL um, higher, or it's more common in patients with diabetes, but it's also a more progressive disease. You can see that up to 60 to 70% of patients with type 2 diabetes may have NAFL, most of those with, with NAFL, but, um, but a, a higher percentage have NASH. So it's a more progressive disease. In fact, it's been estimated that anywhere from a quarter to, to even a third of patients with obesity or type 2 diabetes actually have NASH, so the more advanced form of fatty liver disease. 
And if we look at risk factors associated with NAPLE, um, obesity and type 2 diabetes were at the, at the top of the list. Here are some other less common risk factors. And if we look at risk factors for the progression from NAPFOL to NASH, again, obesity, type 2 diabetes, older age, female sex, particularly postmenopausal females, non African American ethnicity, and hypertension, very high on that list. And um, also very importantly, if we look at patients with type 2 diabetes, if we see at the top of this bullet, as I mentioned, not only more susceptible to NAPL, but also more susceptible to progression, so the more severe forms, and advanced fibrosis, so F3 and F4 fibrosis is thought to be present in up to 5% of patients with type 2 diabetes. Importantly, NAPL in a patient with type 2 diabetes increases even further cardiovascular risk. It's been looked at and, you know, up to twofold greater in patients with type 2 diabetes. And NAPL is associated with approximately 70% higher overall mortality in people with type 2 diabetes compared with the general population. So clearly a very important um, disease in patients with type 2 diabetes. Now, for the reasons uh, mentioned before, if we look at the overarching goals of NASH therapy is to prevent liver-related morbidity and mortality, but also these patients are at very high risk of cardiovascular risk, of cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. So this needs to be addressed very aggressively as well. So treating uh, modifiable cardiovascular risk factors. And if we look now at type 2 diabetes, this looks at the, the pathophysiology. So many different defects in different organs and tissues which contribute to hyperglycemia. We're very fortunate today to have medications, different medications that address these defects to help reduce the glucose. And if we look at the optimal management or the overarching goals of type 2 diabetes treatment, uh, it is to normalize the glucose to the extent possible. And we often have to use multiple agents with complementary mechanisms of action to do this. And our aim is to achieve the best possible glycemic control with the least possible side effects. And very importantly, particularly now that we have data with the GLP-1 receptor agonist and the SGLT-2 inhibitor showing a reduction in the development and certainly in the progression of cardiovascular disease, um, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, heart failure, <coughs> excuse me, and renal dysfunction, um, it's very important to place patients on medications, particularly that are at high risk or have pre-existing disease that may improve their morbidity and mortality. Um, but I would add to this that this should be also and or liver disease. So not only progression of cardiovascular and or renal disease, but also and or liver disease, and most specifically fatty liver disease. And if we look at the approach to a patient with type 2 diabetes, this is from the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, the lifestyle therapy, cornerstone, so healthy diet, physical activity, weight loss. But in patients who are at high risk, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, heart failure, or renal dysfunction, the recommendation is independent of the hemoglobin A1C, so independent of glucose control, patients should be treated with metformin and either a GLP-1 receptor agonist, particularly of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease um, predominate, or an SGLT2 inhibitor if heart failure and or um, chronic kidney disease predominates. And these are the same recommendations from the American Diabetes Association and the European Association for the Study of Diabetes, first-line therapy, um, lifestyle to promote weight loss if needed, metformin, and then again in high-risk patients or patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, heart failure, or renal dysfunction, considering GLP-1 receptor agonists or SGLT2 inhibitors as first and certainly a second line therapy. So what I'm gonna do in the rest of the talk is just talk about some of the therapies, including weight management, that intersect, if you will, type two diabetes and NAPL. So we'll talk about weight loss, the thiazolidine dione, so specifically thioglitazone, the SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, we'll talk about empagliflozin, canagliflozin, and dapagliflozin, the GLP-1 receptor agonists, um, particularly dulaglutide and semaglutide. And then in the newer, not yet approved for diabetes, but what are called unimolecular multi-agonists. So dual agonists of the two incretins, GLP-1 and GIP, 
agonists of GLP-1 in the glucagon receptor, and they're also not triple agonists of GIP, GLP-1, and the glucagon receptor. So let's start with weight loss. I think you know these data very well, but the greater the weight loss, the greater the improvement in fatty liver disease is the bottom line. And um, this is all dependent on the degree of weight loss, but as patients even lose 3% weight loss and greater, the improvement in steatosis could be in anywhere from a third to 100% of the patients. As they go losing more weight, you get improvements in ballooning and inflammation. In patients greater than 7% weight loss, anywhere from 64 to 90% of these patients have a NASH resolution. And in patients with significant weight loss, greater than 10%, even improvements in fibrosis. The issue is that it's just very difficult not only to achieve this level of weight loss, but to sustain it. And this is a study where um, these data come from. This is a, a year-long study, so 52 weeks. Overall, these patients with lifestyle um, changes lost 3.8% on body weight. It was a 25% um, of the patients had resolution of NASH. Significant improvements in the NAFLD activity score. So the, the max score is eight, and this is based on steatosis, lobular inflammation, and ballooning and fibrosis regression in about 20% of patients. And this increased, these positive trends increased with greater weight loss. And in fact, again, those patients who had greater than 10% weight loss um, had actually a mean of 13% weight loss, had NASH resolution in 90% of patients, 100% of the patients had at least a two-point improvement in the NAFLD activity score, and 45% of the patients had regression of fibrosis defined as at least one point improvement or decrease in fibrosis. The problem is that only 29 of the 293 patients, so about 10% of the patients, were able to either achieve and achieve and maintain this level of weight loss at one year. So very difficult to do even in the setting of a clinical trial and, um, and certainly very difficult to maintain this level of weight loss or weight loss that can actually improve, significantly improve fibrosis. So this is the PIVINS trial. You're probably very familiar with this. This um, was published, gosh, over 10 years ago um, in the New England Journal. And this is a, a 96-week trial, double-blind, um, placebo-controlled, um, paired biopsies. And this was in, in patients with bi biopsy-proven NASH, looking at pioglitazone, in this case, 30 milligrams daily, so not the highest dose, and vitamin E, um, 800 um, international units per day, in 247 patients. None of these patients had diabetes and none had cirrhosis, so no, no stage four fibrosis. In fact, you can see that a baseline the NAFLD activity score was about five out of eight, and the fibrosis stage, the mean fibrosis stage was 1.5. But very importantly, you see the primary endpoint was histologic features of NASH, and this is looking at the, the percent of patients with improvement, significantly improved with vitamin E, Although it was improved numerically, it did not reach statistical significance with, pi with pioglitazone, but pioglitazone had significant, um, compared, to, um, compared to placebo, significant improvement for greater patients who had resolution of NASH, who had um, improvement in steatosis and lobular inflammation as well. And neither of them had significant improvements compared to placebo in, um, in fibrosis. But, but definitely activity with pioglitazone with respect to, to NASH, and particularly with respect to steatosis. Um, Ken Kusi published this in Annals of Internal Medicine, a very nice study, 18-month study, and this was actually in patients with pioglitazone in patients with prediabetes or type 2 diabetes, so 100 patients um, versus placebo, and this was pioglitazone at the highest dose, 45 milligrams daily, and um, it was about half pre-diabetic patients and half type 2 diabetes, but you see significant improvements, again, in the primary endpoint, which was at least a two-point reduction in the NAFLD activity score with no worsening of NASH, 58% of patients, resolution of NASH in 51% of the patients, and um, a non-significant um, increase in the percent of patients who had at least a one-point improvement in their fibrosis score. Now, in both of these studies and other studies that have assessed um, pioglitazone, the issue is significant weight gain in some patients' edema, certainly in diabetes. We're very careful with this drug, particularly in patients with heart failure and in patients in combination with insulin. So there are clearly some side effects that need to be weighed. But the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease, AASLD, their guidance, although there's no approved therapy for NASH specifically, they say that pioglitazone 
um, in patients with biopsy proven NASH improves liver histology in patients with and without type 2 diabetes. Um, the risks, and there are risks, need to be weighed against the benefits and should be discussed with the patients. And without biopsy proven NASH, um, they say it should not be used in patients with NAP1. We see on your left-hand side, metformin really, very important drug and sort of the cornerstone of therapy along with, with diet and exercise for type 2 diabetes has not been shown to improve NASH. And GLP-1 receptor agonist, what the society says is it's premature to consider specifically treating NASH with GLP-1 receptor agonists, though they are either first or second line therapy if patients have access to them for patients with type 2 diabetes. And we'll show some of that data, and that may change in time clearly based on some of the information. So we'll look now at just a few studies on, on SGLT2 inhibitors. I'm not aware of any biopsy studies with SGLT2 inhibitors specifically looking at NASH, but there are a lot of retrospective studies or very short sort of proof of concept studies looking at liver fat content and, and LFT or liver function tests as well. This was a study looking at empagliflozin was retrospective and looked at three very large databases, including the um, EMPA-REG outcome trial database. And what it showed is that epigliflozin consistently lowered ALT and AST concentrations. Um, ALT concentrations were lowered sort of significantly um, greater than AST, and these reductions in ALT were more prominent, as would be expected in patients with higher baseline ALT, and the reductions in ALT seemed to be, or they were largely independent of changes in the hemoglobin A1C and in body weight. So it appears that there's some independent factor, and it's not just the body weight reduction you see with SGLT2 inhibitors. This is a study from Japan that looked at the SGLT2 inhibitor hypergliflozin versus pioglitazone. So we saw that pioglitazone definitely has activity in patients with NAPL. Relatively short study. But you can see that the improvement in ALT and AST, both with pioglitazone and ipergliflozin, was significant compared to, um, to baseline and not different between the two therapeutics. And this looks at the FIB4 index. So this is an, an index of the ALT, AST, I think it's platelets and age, which um, can give an indication if a patient has advanced or does not have advanced fibrosis. And you can see that both with pioglitazone and with ipergliflozin, there was an improvement in the FIB4 index um, from baseline, but no difference between the two treatments. And then if you look all the way on the left, these authors, or the, the researchers, looked at liver to spleen att attenuation ratio on CAT scan as an indication of steatosis, and there was improvement both with pioglitazone and ipergliflozin, no difference between the two in both with both pyo and epigliflozin, there was an improvement in adiponectin, so higher adiponectin, although it was higher as might be expected with pyoglitazone. And then visceral and subcutaneous fat was also looked at with, with CAT scan, and there was an improvement compared to pyoglitazone with epigliflozin in both of these. So I think, again, proof of concept, but clearly the SGLT2 inhibitors have some activity in fatty liver disease. Here's an eight-week study now looking at dapagliflozin, um, and this was in patients with type 2 diabetes, obese patients, the BMI was 32 with good glucose control or baseline, and looked at dapagliflozin versus placebo. And on your left, this was looking at liver fat content with an MRI PDFS, so protein density fat fraction, significant reduction compared to placebo, both in fat content and fat volume, and, um, and also improvements, if you look on your right, in visceral and subcutaneous adipose tissue volume with dapagliflozin compared to placebo. And this is an eight-week study, so very, very short. Here's a study looking at empagliflozin, a bit longer study, 24 weeks, again, in patients with type 2 diabetes. These were obese patients, um, but very well controlled at baseline. And you can see, um, looking at body weight, as would be expected with an SGLT2 inhibitor, significantly greater reduction in body weight compared to placebo. And also, again, looking at um, liver fat content significantly better or lower liver fat content or greater improvement in liver fat content with, um, with empagliflozin compared to placebo, and importantly, an increase in adiponectin in these patients treated with the SGLT2 inhibitor. So I think um, it remains to be seen where this goes. My feeling is that um, you know, these are critically important drugs now for cardiologists, for nephrologists, and certainly for endocrinologists. And, um, and I certainly think that um, they will play an important role maybe as an adjunct to therapy for fatty liver disease as time goes on. So we'll see what the studies bear out.
Now, GLP-1 receptor agonists, a lot of data and actually later stage trials specifically in NASH with the GLP-1 receptor agonist, multifactorial effects for obesity, diabetes, improvement in cardiovascular risk and renal risk as well, and in fatty liver disease. Um, this actually looks at the weight loss scene. That probably the most powerful um, SG, uh, SGLP2, GLP-1 receptor agonist today is semaglutide um, at the highest dose of one milligram. And this basically just looks at head-to-head um, -head trials looking at different um, GLP-1 receptor agonists and weight reduction. If you look in the middle, I think the most important study is probably SUSTAIN-7, which compared semaglutide to dulaglutide. And semaglutide, after 40 weeks, at the highest dose, the one milligram dose, 6.5 um, kilogram weight reduction compared to 3.0 kilograms with the highest previous dose of dulaglutide, 1.5 milligrams. And in that trial, if you look at your right, 63% of the semaglutide treated patients at the higher dose achieved at least 5% weight loss, so greater than 5% weight loss, um, compared to 30% of the patients treated with the 1.5 milligram dose or the highest dose of dulaglutide. Um, what we recently presented, actually this is a presentation I gave at the American Diabetes Association, the 52-week data from a trial looking at higher doses of dulaglutide for glycemic control and a secondary endpoint with weight control. And here we see the change in body weight with higher doses of dulaglutide. So in blue is a 1.5 milligram dose. Um, then you see the, the three milligram dose and the 4.5 once weekly dose in red. So there was significantly greater weight loss at the higher doses of dulaglutide up to five kilograms at 52 weeks. And it looked like it may be continuing. And in this study, 53% of patients at week 52 achieved greater than or equal to 5% weight loss. And some of glutide is now being looked at in diabetes study, at two milligrams once weekly as well. And that study should be ending um, this month or next month, according to clinicaltrials.gov. So we'll see what happens with this. But I think very impressively from a weight perspective, the STEP trials, which are the semaglutide trial specifically for obesity, um, recently reported in, in press releases. We'll need to see the full data. But here you see the study, step one, step three, step four, step two. Um, and you see the, um, the change in body weight, the percent change in body weight, and anywhere from 16 to 18% in the, in the studies in non-diabetics and 10% mean in the studies uh, I mean patients with diabetes. So very impressive. These are higher doses of semaglutide. I believe it was 2.4 milligrams um, in these patients at 68 weeks. And you can see, for example, yeah, 2.4 milligrams. You can see in step one in non-diabetics, greater than 20% weight loss achieved by almost 35% of the patients after 68 weeks. Who, may, who continued on the medication. So very powerful, we'll see what happens with this with FDA. And if we look specifically at the GLP-1 receptor agonist in patients with NASH, this is a so-called lean study, it was done in the UK, kind of a pilot study, looking at patients with NASH, with and without type two diabetes. Um, they had a NAFLD activity score of at least greater than three, their A1C had to be lower than 9%, and basically treated with liraglutide, so once daily injection, 1.8 milligrams, versus placebo for 48 weeks with paired liver biopsies. And what was seen here, the primary endpoint was a proportion of patients with significant improvement in liver histology. So this was NASH resolution and no worsening of fibrosis. And that was seen in about 40% of the liraglutide treated patients compared to 9% of placebo. And with liraglutide, there was greater improvement in body weight and also a greater reduction in ALT. And the authors, um, the, the researchers did some analyses and, and concluded that not all of the improvement in liver histology was due to weight loss. Um, and here's a study looking at dulaglutide. Um, this was not a biopsy study. This was recently, last month, published in um, Diabetologia, 24-week study, patients with type 2 diabetes and fatty liver disease um, with a P, uh, uh, proton density fat fraction, so uh, greater than 6% of baseline, and compared dulaglutide, so the um, trade name Trulicity, versus usual care. And the primary endpoint was fat content at 24 weeks. And you can see with dulaglutide patients had a significant reduction in liver fat content, 
and improved um, GGT levels, and there were trends towards improvement in ALT and AST. And at the bottom there, you can see that the patients treated with dulaglutide had a relative change in liver fat content of 32%, and this an absolute change of about 6%, and this was significantly greater than with placebo or with usual care, I should say, the control group. And this is, I think, very, these are very um, interesting data. This, this is um, the preliminary data from the semaglutide for NASH phase two study. So these were patients um, with biopsy proven NASH. I mean, they had type two diabetes, A1C less than 9%. The primary endpoint was NASH resolution without worsening of fibrosis, so similar to the lean study. And here you can see 320 patients with either stage one, two, or three fibrosis and NASH. And they were treated with semaglutide daily. In this case, it was 0 0.1, 0 0.2, or 0 0.4 milligrams daily, or placebo. And you can see the results on your right. This is in the about 230 patients. This is preliminary from um, Novo Nordisk um, website and their press releases that had stage two and three fibrosis. They met the primary endpoint with all of these doses. So the 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and 0 0.4 milligram with up to 60% of patients meeting the primary endpoint at the higher doses. And from a safety perspective, the most important side effects as expected with, um, with the GLP-1 receptor items were GI related, but really no different to what's been seen in diabetes studies. And I just show this slide to point out that there have been um, quite a few studies, in fact, four large studies looking at the combination of GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT-2 inhibitors um, in diabetes, not, not in NASH, but you do get greater weight reduction. And I think this would be a very nice combination, certainly, to look at um, in patients with fatty liver disease. I'll finish up with a couple of the, the, the unimolecular um, multi-agonists. So this is terzepatide, which is a dual GIP and GLP-1 receptor agonist. This is a paper we published in Lancet in 2018, looking at patients with type 2 diabetes, and you can see significant improvements. In red, you see dulaglutide, um, so trulicity, a 1.1% reduction, <clears throat> excuse me, in hemoglobin A1C, which is what you would expect to see. But with terzepatide, particularly at the higher doses, a 2 and 2.4% reductions in A1C from a baseline of about 8% at 26 weeks, and significant improvements in body weight, you know, up to 11 kilos from a baseline of 90, a little over 90 kilograms. And if we look, you know, with uh, almost 40% of patients having greater than 10% weight loss and up to a quarter of the patients having greater than 15% weight loss in these patients. Um, with the same database, um, this was published in Diabetes Care. I'm recently um, um, looking at biomarkers of NASH in these patients with type 2 diabetes. There were significant improvements, particularly at the higher doses of terzepatide and ALT and AST in K18, so a marker of hepatocyte apoptosis in NASH, in Pro-C3, a marker of, um, of hepatic fibrosis, particularly at the 15 milligram dose, and increases in adiponectin as well. So based on the weight data that we saw in, in phase two, and a lot of the preclinical work as well in NASH and these analyses, um, Eli Lilly is currently conducting a phase two study assessing terzepatide specifically in NASH. And I'd like to finish up then with a dual um, receptor agonist of GLP-1 and glucagon. Um, and these data were presented at ESOL um, just last month. And these are, this is an analysis of a 54-week study in overweight and obese patients with type 2 diabetes, where we saw very nice reductions um, with codatutide in, um, in or the authors did, in, um, in body weight, as well as hemoglobin A1C. But um, there were also significant improvements in ALT and AST, and this is compared to liraglutide, 1.8 milligrams, you can see here in yellow. So independent of weight, there were significantly greater improvements in ALT and AST compared to liraglutide, and also improvements in some of the same markers I showed for, for terzepatide with respect to markers of liver fibrosis, and markers of, of oxidative stress as well. So um, based on these data, um, and based on the weight loss data, a, a phase two proof of concept study has started with this dual agonist of, of um, GLP-1 and glucagon receptor, started in September 2019, and it's estimated, this is according to clinicaltrials.gov, to end in June of 2021.
So I'll show this slide only to let you know, and you know better than I do, just how many medications are being now studied for the treatment of NASH. I think, um, you know, the, you know, I think it's very exciting to have medications also that can address so many features and, and um, the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes and at the same time address um, this very important liver disease as well. And we're really looking forward, I think, all of us to seeing data with the GLP-1 receptor agonist, particularly uh, semaglutide data, and then the dual and um, even triple um, and, um, agonists um, of the incretins and um, glucagon as well in the future. So to conclude, NAPLD is, a very, is very common in patients with type 2 diabetes and is more progressive and is associated with increased cardiovascular risk and overall mortality in this patient population. As with type 2 diabetes, lifestyle modification is the cornerstone of NAPLD management. It should be instituted in all patients and will receive tremendous improvements in liver health with reductions in body weight. And although there are currently no approved pharmacotherapies for the treatment of NASH, some therapeutic classes, particularly the GLP-1 receptor agonists and the SGLT-2 inhibitors, which are used today in the treatment of type 2 diabetes, have favorable effects with respect to fatty liver disease and are currently being studied for this indication. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Again, I thank the Pakistan Society um, of Hepatology for this kind invitation, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you very much. Pleasure to listening to you. Uh, I will now request Professor Amanullah Basi, who has graced us with his presence, for concluding remarks, and then I'll ask the rest of the chairs to give their remarks, concluding this session also. Professor Abbasi. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. We are very grateful and we are very thankful to our organization team uh, of the hepatology. Uh, and we are very thankful to our speakers, international speakers, especially thanks to Paul Kao, professor, and Yuan P. Fraz, professor, and uh, they really presented very beautifully and they highlighted the points very concisely. And I'm very thankful to our professor Anwar A. Khan who highlighted the present and past and the future gastroenterologist international as well as the national. Uh, he talked about the Professor Sarwar Zuberi. Uh, she was really very founder and she was the pillar of the gastroenterology and uh, she put all the efforts and regarding the hepatology and we are very grateful and we pray for her uh, for uh, always we are praying for her as well and we are very thankful to our organization team which is present over here and which are present with us on the zoom so this was really very first time in Pakistan and we are I think we are the pioneers and uh, this will be the most important precedence for the uh, rest of all uh, conferences in Pakistan. I am very grateful to uh, our mediator, uh, Dr. Bushra. She is also very intelligent and she presented very well. So thank you very much. Now we are going to close the section and for announcement of the next section as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Abbasi. I would now like uh, Professor Sharbat Khan Mandokhel to give his remarks about the session. Professor Sharbat Khan. Uh, I will now request Professor Altaf Alam to give his, uh, sorry, uh, I would now request Professor Arif Mahmood Siddiqui, I see him over there, for his concluding remarks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Usha, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, thank you for allow allowing me to uh, uh, make some comments here. I thoroughly enjoyed the session. Um, it was full of uh, academic nutrition, which was easily assimilable. 
uh, about uh, Professor Anwar's uh, talk. I think he summarized the international and the local gastroenterology and hepatology scene very well. Allow me to mention two more names um, in, in the canvas of Pakistan. First is that of Professor Khwaja Sadiq Hussain, um, who we consider as pioneer of gastroenterology and hepatology in Punjab. Uh, Professor Sarwar Jahan Zubairi's uh, area of work uh, was mainly in Sindh and Karachi, but then it became uh, national and international. Similarly, Khwaja Saab introduced uh, endoscopy in Punjab and uh, not only that, uh, he himself uh, carried out gastroenterology and hepatology work, but he mentored <clears throat> a lot of uh, young doctors who later on became um, uh, competent gastroenterologists and served Punjab very well. Uh, Professor Altaf Alam, uh, Professor Shweb Shafi, Dr. Muide Khan, Dr. Uh, Tariq Hamid, Dr. Babar Amin, Dr. Khawar, and a bit of myself. Um, we were all products of Professor Khwaja Sadiq Hussain. He also patronized Professor Siptul Asnan and Professor Nusratullah Chaudhary, who took upon themselves the work of uh, gastroenterology and hepatology and uh, advanced uh, endoscopies. Uh, so I would like to pay tribute to Professor Khwaja Saab here. The second name, uh, which uh, Professor Anwar did not highlight very well, was that of Professor Anwari Khan himself. Out of humility, um, I think he he could not and did not uh, mention his contributions in local gastroenterology in Pakistan. When Khaja Saab's East Medical Ward um, was gradually going down in, um, in gastroenterology work, uh, Sheikh Zaid and his center, they came to limelight. And um, Professor Anwari Khan, one of his contribution was that uh, when Khwaja Saab was uh, president of uh, CPSP, they joined hand and uh, they, struck, they made a structured training program for gastroenterology. Uh, I think this is a, a, a not very known fact because that led to uh, the gastroenterologists of today most of the young gastroenterologists of today are the product of uh, Sheikh Zayed Hospital and uh, the center which he pioneered for a number of years. So I would like to thank these two uh, great men for their, uh, for their contribution in hepatology and gastroenterology. As for the second lecture, <clears throat> uh, uh, Dr. Paul Koo um, uh, did full justice with his uh, uh, concourse on uh, chronic hepatitis C um, in special populations and he speak, spoke brilliantly and summarized <clears throat> such a wild wild field uh, in such easy terms. Um, uh, hepatitis C fascinates all of us uh, of my age, about, I'm about 60, um, because we saw the beginning and we can now think of the end of this uh, disease as well. So we have seen this disease evolve and then hopefully dissolve. Uh, third lecture was again <clears throat> very important and very eloquently delivered. Uh, I especially like the last one third where the newer management strategies were, were discovered. And uh, I thought, uh, uh, I thought uh, that was very nicely dealt with. So my thank you to all these three speakers uh, and the organizer, uh, Professor Faruqi, um, Professor Altaf Alam, Dr. Bushra and their team for organizing such a wonderful uh, seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Arif Mehmood Siddiqui, for very well-received comments regarding Professor anwar -e Khan. You're right, out of humility, he did not mention himself at all. Uh, I will now request Professor Altaf Alam for his concluding remarks, which will then bring us to the end of the session. Professor Altaf. Thank you very much, Dr. Bushra. It was really a treat 
to uh, attend this session. Um, a great academic feast. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, one more thing about Professor Anwar Khan. I have had the pleasure of working with him for over two decades, and I would also call him the father of transplant in Pakistan. He laid the foundation of the first transplant center in Pakistan, along with his team, including me. So uh, apart from starting the post-graduation in the field of gastroenterology and hepatology, along with a few of his colleagues, he is also responsible for starting transplant program of uh, uh, liver in Pakistan. So uh, thanks to Professor Anwar, you have done wonders uh, for us. And, you know, uh, we all owe it to you to, uh, to thank you for all your contributions in the field of gastroenterology and hepatology in Pakistan. Thank you very much. And uh, I hand over to Dr. Bushra to conclude the session. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Altaf. Yes, immense contribution from Prof Professor anwar -e Khan. And each one of us from Sheikh Zaid is proud to have been mentored by the likes of Professor Anwar and Professor Altaf Alam. Uh, the next session is the general body meeting of uh, Pakistan Society of Hepatology. Without any break, we will be uh, moving on to that. The link for the meeting has already been circulated. Please, uh, I'll be sh finishing this meeting, and then we will be moving to the general body meeting. Yes. Uh, just a quick thing. Uh, so general body meeting, we would request. There are a lot of participants online right now. So please stay on if you want to listen uh, and give your feedback on the meeting and everything. And there is a closing ceremony, which is actually open to the public, uh, to uh, most of the people who want to watch it. So, uh, but the organizing committee uh, is requested to join us. It's supposed to start at 12.30. We are running late, so we'll start about 15 minutes late. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned.